Our scripture lesson this morning from the Old Testament is from Psalms, the uh, 27th chapter, verses 1 through 7. Vindicate me, O Lord, for I have walked in, thy, in my integrity, and I have trusted in the Lord without wavering. Prove me, O Lord, and try me. Test my heart and my mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in your faithfulness. I do not sit with men of falsehood, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the assembly of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence, and I go around your altar, O Lord, proclaiming thanksgiving aloud and telling all your wondrous deeds. And from the New Testament, it's not Mark 105, it's Mark 15, and it's verses uh, 17 through 28. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed, and spitting on him, and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak, and put his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgoth Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on the left. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I want to share a story with you that I read not too long ago. A very touching story, a true story. In the 15th century, in a village near Nuremberg, lived a man who had 18 children. And in order to keep food on the table, this man who was a goldsmith by profession worked 18 hours or more a day at his profession and at any other paying chores that he could find. Well, two of his sons had a dream they wanted to pursue the dream of studying art at the University of Nuremberg. Now, they knew their father could never afford to send either of them, so together they worked out a pack. They would toss a coin, and the loser would go to work down in the mines for four years, and with his earnings would support his brother for the next four years at the academy in Nuremberg. And after the four years, they would switch places. And the brother who had been going to the university would work in the mines and support his brother as he was able to go. Well, they tossed a coin, and the brother Albrecht Durer won the toss and went off to Nuremberg while his brother Albert went to work in the mines. Now, brother Albrecht was very good at what he did in his etchings and his wood cuttings and with his oils. In fact, over the years, while he was at the university, some of his work was even better than some of his instructors. And by the time he graduated, he was earning considerable fees for his works. But he returned to his village, and they gave a great party for him and in his honor. And at the dinner, he stood up, this glass, and he toasted his brother Albert and said, Now, brother Albert, blessed brother of mine, it is your turn. Now you can go to Nuremberg to pursue your dreams, and I will take care of you. And Albert, with tears streaming down his face, stood up and smiled through the tears and said, No, no, brother. No, I cannot go. It's too late for me. And as he said that he held up his hand and said, look what four years in the mines have done to my hands. 
The bones in every finger have been smashed at least once. I cannot even hold a glass. Dear brother, it's too late for me. Now, more than 450 years have passed since that time, and many of Albrecht Dewar's works hang in museums all over the world, but chances are you are only familiar with one of his works. In fact, many of you may even have a reproduction of his works in your home. What was that work? Well, to pay homage to his brother for all that he sacrificed, Albrecht painstakingly sketched his brother's abused hands with palms together, fingers stretched skyward. And he simply called his powerful work, Hands. Well, this masterpiece was immediately embraced by the world who opened their hearts to this masterpiece and renamed it the Praying Hands. In fact, if you look at the front of your bulletin this morning, you will see this representation of the Praying Hands, of the work of Albrecht Dewar. And as you look at that, at that powerful work this morning, Realize that these hands represent love, a sacrificial love that one person made for another. And I hope that as you look at this picture, you will also remember what sacrifice is all about. Now, today is World Communion Sunday, and I cannot think of a better thing to talk about today than sacrifice. Sacrifice that we make that our parents made for us, sacrifice that we made for our children, sacrifices that others have made for us and that we have made, and above all and, and most importantly, the sacrifice that Jesus made for each of us. Now, in our scripture today, Jesus was walking along and a man ran up to him and fell on his knees and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responded by saying, why do you call me good? Now, notice that Jesus did not say that he wasn't good. As a matter of fact, Scripture tells us that Jesus was sinless. And also notice what the man asked. He said, what can I do? What can I do to inherit the kingdom of God? What can I do for salvation? Well, what can I do for salvation? What I can do for salvation is nothing. But what Jesus can do and did do is everything. So Jesus answered this man by saying, you know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false witness. And the man answered, but teacher, all these things I have kept since I was a small boy. And then Jesus answered and said, one thing you lack. Go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come to me. Then come and serve me. And then come and follow me. Now, this man's sin was not that he had money, but that the money, in a sense, had him. In a sense, his God was wealth. And Mark says that at this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Well, then Jesus turned and said to his disciples, How hard is it for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of heaven? Now, notice here that Jesus not only mentioned the rich folks, but he mentioned everybody. The difficulty for all of us to enter into the kingdom of heaven, not just those who are wealthy. Jesus said it would be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, some biblical scholars have suggested that the eye of a needle may have been a very low gate that entered into the city of Jerusalem that a large camel would have had great difficulty going through as they entered into the city of Jerusalem. We're told that the disciples were even more astonished and said to him, who then can be saved? Now the disciples were right in asking this, and asking this question, who can be saved? Because the answer is no one. 
No one can be saved, at least not alone, not on their own. Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Folks, when it comes to salvation, all we can do is trust God. And when you think about it, really all that we do, all that we are, all that we ever will be is in God's hands. Well, what can we do apart from Christ? Well, Jesus himself answered this when he said, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And Paul reassures us of this when he said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. See, nothing is impossible with God through Christ. Folks, we need to get that right perspective. When Goliath came up against the Israelites, the soldiers all thought, he's so big that we can't kill him. Whereas David looked at the same giant and thought, he's so big, I can't miss. See, God honors radical, rich talking, risk-taking faith. When arcs are built, lives are saved. When soldiers march, Jericho's tumble, when staffs are raised, seas are opened, and when lunch is shared, thousands are fed, and when a garment is touched, Jesus stops. What can I do to be saved today? I can take hold of the hand of Jesus. You know, the, the rich man who came up and asked Jesus what he could do to be saved, his only mistake was in asking, Lord, what can I do? Folks, there's nothing that we can do. When I used to teach evangelism some years ago, one of the things that we asked people was, if you were, if you were to die and you were to stand in front of God and God said, why should I let you into heaven? How would you answer that? And the majority of the people that we talked to would, would give a response like, I would tell God that I tried to live a good life. I would tell God that I tried to follow the Ten Commandments. I would tell God that I tried to do good to one another. I tried to help my fellow man. Well, what are you saying? I should get into heaven on the things that I have done. And that's what the rich man was saying. I have done all those things. I've kept all those commandments. I've been good, Lord. I've been good. Isn't that good enough? Jesus said, no. You are worshiping something other than God. Your money has you. You don't have your money. Your money has you. And you need to, to, to take down that barrier between you and your money. That's separating you from God. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Then you come and you follow me. Then you come and serve me. And unlike the disciples who gave up everything, gave up gave up their, their jobs as, as fishermen, gave up their jobs as tax collectors, gave all those things up to follow Jesus, this man couldn't do it. We're told that he put his head down and left rejectedly because he couldn't let go of the one thing in life that he worshipped more than God. And that was his possessions. What can I do? What I can do is not worry about all the good things that I do. We need to do those things. Don't, don't misunderstand me. We need to be kind. and We need to do good things for other people. We need to help other people. But above all, the first thing that we need to do is admit the life that we have. Admit who we are. Admit where we are in life and that we can't handle things on our own and accept Christ as our Lord and our Savior. Because that above anything else is the only thing that's going to save us. Nothing else. Not all the possessions we have, not all the goodness that we do, none of those things is going to save us. Only turning our life over to Christ. Now I began this sermon by telling you about a pair of hands. Hands that, a sacrifice that one brother made for another. But I want to tell you about another pair of hands. They are the same hands that have nail scars on them. Hands that we remember today, as we remember the sacrifice that Jesus made, as we know that he loved us that much to stretch his hands out that far. 
hands that were nailed to a cross for our sins. And we find those, hand, those same hands today stretched out, not this way, stretched out this way, welcoming each of us, reaching out for us with a voice behind them saying, come to me, all of you, each and every one of you, those who are weary, those who are afraid, those who are hurting, those who are lost, those who are heavy laden, come to me and I will give you rest. It's not your money that's going to give you rest. It's not your fame or your fortune that's going to give you rest. <clears throat> Many famous and rich people in our world have proven that. All the money and all the fame and all the power and they're still mercifully unhappy because they haven't accepted the one thing that they need to accept to find true happiness and that's salvation through Jesus Christ. These are the same hands that as they reach out for us, we also reach up to touch if we desire salvation. Those are the strong and steady and forgiving hands of Jesus. The hands that willingly bled for each and every one of us. Those are the loving hands of God. And today, as we remember the body and the blood of Jesus, broken for each of us, bled and shed for each of us, today especially, all the things that Jesus taught, and Jesus taught a number of things. The one thing that we are told that Jesus wanted us to remember was the sacrifice that He made. Remembering His body that was broken. Remembering His blood that was shed. But we know that on the night that Jesus was, was taken prisoner, that He was betrayed, that He was tortured and beaten, he dined with his disciples, and as they reclined around the table during the meal, Jesus held up his hands for silence, and he took the bread and gave thanks to God and then broke the bread, giving it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, each of you. Take and eat this. This represents my body, broken for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. And then when supper had finished, Jesus took the cup. <clears throat> And gave thanks to God and then gave it to the disciples and said, Take and drink of this, all of you, for this is my blood. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it. And so we lift these elements up today. This representing the body of Jesus. This representing the blood of Jesus. And Lord, we ask that you bless these elements. May they be for us the body and the blood of Christ. And bless each of us today as we partake of this. May we in time, through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, better serve you. And as you bless these, Lord, bless us as we partake of this and bless us on our journeys. As we are here, as we leave this place, and as we return to the places that we are, Lord, we ask that you return with us, that your body and your blood stays with us as a part of us, for it is through him with Him and in Him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is Yours, Almighty Father, this day and forevermore, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.